All right. So let's go over lesson two now. I don't think anyone is ever writing so that you can throw it away. You're always writing for it to be something. This is a quote by Steve Martin, and he's totally right. Whoever writes content, assuming it's not going to be used, that's just a shitty feeling. And I don't want you guys to ever write content thinking that, hey, you know, it may not be used or it's not going to be great or whatever it may be. You need to have in mind that, hey, we're going to use this content. We're going to make it amazing. So I don't want you guys to just start going out there and be like, oh, this content's not great. There's ways you can make it better and fine tune it. And I'll start showing you some of the ways. So firstly, if you haven't used cognitive SEO, you should consider checking it out. You can put in a term and it says analyze. You analyze and I'll give you data on that term. All right, where keyword difficulty, volume, average content performance, etc. And it gives you a lot of data, right? All the way from relevancy to number of words, to volume, to cost per click. And it's pretty cool. But where I like uh, cognitive SEO is there's a content assistant and you can click start optimizing your content. So let's take this page for example. This is mine on content marketing. I can then go view my source code, right? So I type in the keyword content marketing. I view my source code. Um, I type in the keyword content marketing. Then I go to content assistant, this is in cognitive. Then I go to my page, which I have the content marketing posts. I click view my source code. This is in Chrome. I copy it all. I then paste the title and then the content in there. I click check score and it'll tell me keywords you already used, 29, keywords you should be using, right? This will all help my posts rank better and do much better. And it's worth using this because this will help your content much more thorough, much more effective, and it'll rank way higher. And we do this for a lot of our content. Um, and you can see it for ranking analysis for people who are already ranking really high for, you know, let's say content marketing as a term, you can see who ranks, what they're including, what they're not including, and this just helps you crush it over time. So when it comes to editing, it's not just about writing once and calling it a day, it's about continually fine tuning over time, right? Nate just walked in, dude, Nate, I've been eating all the almonds and chocolates and stuff. Good. Join me. All right, so when you're doing the editing process, I apologize for the delay there, but when you're doing the editing process and your writing process, one of the best tools to probably use is Google Docs because Google Docs allows you to collaborate with other people. They have tons of fonts, images. They have a spelling check, grammar check, all of that. So it's an amazing tool that helps. And when you're editing, I like to take steps and five steps to be specific. And to make it fun, we've named them for you. So steps, S-T-E-P-S. So let's start with S, strive for brevity. The big problem I'm seeing with people, I tell everyone, hey, have thorough content. But if I tell you to have thorough content and a lot of keywords do well, what's there, what's there a good chance that you're gonna do? You're just gonna start writing content with like 3,000 words and you may end up stuffing. It'll end up weakening your content. It'll be too keyword rich. It adds too much bulk and it wastes the reader's time. You want your content to be strong and lean. You want to filter out words that are vague, make them more thorough, and you want to get to the point. When you delete filler words, when you get more to the point, it makes your text much better. You want to also cut out redundant words. When you cut out redundant words, again, it'll make your content better and more factual and people are like, oh my god, this is amazing. You're getting to the point. Spelling and grammar is really important. I used to take it for granted until there was this survey, and this survey shows people judge you based on your spelling and grammar. If they think your spelling and grammar is really poorly, then they are not going to think that you're competent and they won't work with you. It's that important. Make sure your grammar, your spelling is perfect, right? I can't emphasize this enough. If you mess up at the beginning, it's okay. You can fix it over time. I use Grammarly, it's a tool. It makes my life simple. It's, uh, they have a Chrome extension, so as I'm typing anything, even on like Facebook, it'll auto-correct for me. 
that helps. I use this a lot when I write out my YouTube descriptions. So consider using that. And it just shows you the errors and it shows you suggestions. It's really cool. It doesn't cost money. It's free. There's also a paid version, but I use a free one. Uh, you also want to end up removing words such as like here, there, or it. And any explicit, ah, explicitives distract. Uh, sorry about that. Like I'm on a tongue twister. I wish I had water, but oh well. So, no, that's okay. You don't have to get it for me. I can get it. I'm good. Thank you. No, 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 no. I'm good. So, <laughs> so a, a good example of this is like there wasn't enough money to pay rent. It's not descriptive enough. It's not needed. It's not necessary. Here's a better example, right? As you can see, it may rain tomorrow. There wasn't enough money to pay the rent. The forecast calls for rain tomorrow. Dr. Bills have bled the family's reserves. They didn't have enough money to pay the rent. You see how that's way better? So next one, technical jargon. If you come from an Ivy League school, you're more likely to use technical jargon from what I've seen from bloggers. Maybe I haven't seen a large enough sample size. But using technical jargon doesn't make you look smart. People just can't relate, and when they can't relate, they're not going to follow you. You're more likely to look like an authority when people understand what you're teaching versus just using all this technical jargon. So make sure you're not wasting your time using words that people don't understand. Um, I love using an app called the Hemingway app. And it's not a phone app. It's a web text space or, yeah, it's a web app in which you just put in information. Um, and when you just put in information or not, yeah. So you go to the web like a Chrome. You type in HemingwayApp.com, and then you can just start typing away. What I meant is like it's not like a desktop app. It's not like a phone app or anything like that. I remember I was giving a speech at a conference. I'm like, yeah, you guys should all check out the Hemingway app. And the number one question in the audience, and I kept getting this, was like, I can't find the app in the iTunes app store. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's called Hemingway app as the website URL, right? It's a website. So it's pretty cool because it just shows the readability. And it'll tell you if it's good, it's bad, it all grades it. And ideally, again, don't use technical jargon. So the third step, ensure your writing flows. This is really important because if it doesn't flow, who's going to keep reading it? you got to make sure your headlines match your subheadlines, your introductions, your body, your conclusions, and goal. If you do all of that, you're much more likely to end up having amazing piece of content. Thank you for the water. All right. So, and I did a test once where I was talking about man jumped out of a plane and survived. Um, with this test, there's no real way unless he had a parachute, right? Now, with this test, what ended up happening is, is people would click, a lot of reads, but a ton of bounce, bounces. Why? Because it didn't all flow, and the headline didn't match the rest of the copy. It's really important for it to all flow and match up. That's why I outline before I start writing, all the way from the introduction to the main uh, body points, and then I go into the conclusion. So when I outline, everyone has a bit difference of process, but I write the introduction first, then I bullet out the conclusion, like the main facts that I'm going to fill in, like the headlines. Then I go into more so that's the body. And then I write the conclusion, and then I go back in, and then I fill out the body. Um, there was one point where I used to do the introduction, then I would write the conclusion, and then I would do the body. It's up to you. You'll figure out what works well for you and how you can streamline it. But you need an outline because then you can see if there's any gaps as you're writing. You also want to look at the pain points. If you don't look at the pain points, well, people aren't going to feel that they need a buy. They're not going to relate to it. They're not going to you know, be like, oh, my God, this solves my problem. If I did this, I would get way more traffic. right? I need to read the rest. I need to keep coming back to neilpatel.com. So think about your musketeer, what are the pain points that they have? How can you create content that helps them solve this? Respect their time. People come to your website, they're looking for a solution, make sure you solve it. If your content can't do that within the writing, then you need to go in and update your old articles or you need to update your new ones or maybe not even publish them if they're just not really solving anyone's pain points, right? And the last step in editing is SEO. 
You want to make sure you include keywords in a natural way, ideally in the first paragraph, if not first sentence. Reduce your keyword stuffing and run the page against your page checklist. If you do that, in general, you should be fine on the SEO front. I also like using Crazy Egg. I can then see the performance of where the readers are dropping off because if people keep sticking around, they're much more likely to keep coming back to your website, read more. Google notices that your time on site's huge. Your rankings also climb at the same time. And that's why I run heat maps using Crazy Egg. And I didn't do this for all pages, but I do this for my main pages. Here's an example of a live heat map. You can see it, right? And so here's some action points for you. One, download your editing checklist, edit a draft article with the checklist, and set up a heat map using Crazy Egg. So follow those action items. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll get into the next section. And this is the last one for today about content marketing. So Vignesh, what are some marketing struggles that you've been facing recently? Um, me? I'm just working on too many things at the same time. <laughs> uh, you know, with all the projects we have going on, so I'm just trying to make sure nothing falls through the cracks and just working on everything. Yes, yeah, Steve had an amazing launch. I was telling him, I'm like, you should shoot for double, although he's already happy. Yeah, he's he's good. <laughs> Um, yeah, he's, he's, he probably wants to get 10,000 subscribers in, so he's like try aiming for that. He wants to put all the money down that he makes on this one and just get 10,000 or 20,000 and go for a big exit. The guy has a really big plan <laughs> for... It's going to be hard, but get there. 10,000 is like what, 2 million bucks. It's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. But he's getting close. He'll have a million dollar launch at least, so, but the question is, is going to be... I think we can because uh, there is a lot of uh, campaigns that we have planned out. So this was just the initial one. We have like five more campaigns planned out afterwards with tripwires and a bunch of different stuff. It's pretty cool. You'll <laughs> yeah, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Um, one more question um, is this for me is uh, can you talk about journeys and case studies just uh, or of you know, a 12 month journey versus a singular blog post or just blog post, the impact of a journey versus a blog post. Like, what would you say the impact is on search, like traffic? The journey more so, it keeps people engaged where they keep coming back. A case study is just mm -hmm. someone comes once and that's it. But ideally, if they keep coming back, you're much better off. You want that brand loyalty. The only way you do that is get people to keep coming back. Oh, I see. So that works really well in markets that are... You're creating a story, you're creating that hook. Mm 